So good morning and welcome. And welcome to everybody who is in the audience. Uh, thank you for joining us again for our Tech of Our Live. So this morning we have with us Agusa Moigui, who is the founding and managing general partner at Echo VC Partners. Agusa has been investing in Africa, in Africa for quite a while before he founded Echo VC. He was at Intel for nearly 10 years, where he was a Intel Capital Director, and he drove investments across semantic technology, smart data, real-time web. Echo VC itself has invested in Frontier Card Group, Migos, which used to be mines at IO, Grow Intelligence, System One, and a number of other companies, both in Africa and uh, North America. So welcome, Agusa. Thank you. So Agusa, I'm going to start a little bit broadly. I'm going to ask two related questions. One is your perspective on Africa's tech ecosystem coming into 2020. Uh, so the way you thought about the continent uh, before this current crisis, just broadly. And the second question, which ties into that, is to talk us through Echo VC's investment thesis broadly. How do you think about investing on the continent? What is it that matters to you? Uh, what kind of companies do you look for? All of that. Yeah, great. Well, thanks again for having me. I was uh, very excited to, to participate in, in this conversation and, and hopefully I can learn as much as I share. Um, for those of you who don't know us, um, we are seed and early stage investors in tech and tech enabled startups that have Africa as a you know, core seriously material market, um, essentially driving these tech tech enabled products and services to the greatest of markets you know whether they are you know east africa west africa south africa or even in, i think in some cases north africa uh, we've been investing uh since 2014 uh, but have been active and monit actively monitoring the ecosystems uh, probably since 2011. before before i started echo vc i was at intel capital i left there in 2010 some of you probably know um, sort of my backstory there, but you know, one of the things I, I always loved doing when I was at Intel Capital was trying to figure out what the future would look like. And so back in 2005, 2006, um, the future looked like it was going to be the internet. And there were gonna be essentially 10 to 15 very large companies that would dominate the internet. And so I recommended the folks, you know, essentially set aside a billion dollars to invest itself. I decided to take some time off to figure out what, what the next sort of 10 years would look like. And it ended up that it wasn't as much around technology, but more around how technology would influence lives of consumers and businesses. And so what that would mean would be where, you know, it felt to me then that it, it, there was a lot of that transition was going to happen with to dramatic effect in the largest underserved markets. And so when I looked around, I mean, I had done you know, investments in, in Asia, I'd done a few investments in India and the like. When I looked around, it felt like no one was paying attention to Africa and Southeast Asia. And those two markets also seemed very curiously, positively correlated. You know, the demographics made sense. The, the, the clear transition to being digitally native made sense. And, you know, the fact that they were being ignored, you know, made no sense. And so I went out to try to raise money uh, for what I call the triangle offense strategy, which was using the valley, Silicon Valley as a base, which was when I, you know, when I lived there, uh, but essentially attacking both Africa and Southeast Asia and looking to cross pollinate. And to a large degree, you know, people dismissed that. And, but, you know, those markets never made sense. China was it, Max, maybe India. Um, but, you know, there was, you know, Africa, Southeast Asia, and, you know, those markets didn't matter. So, you know, I was, you know, I then ended up saying, okay, so which markets should I focus on? You know, a very interesting LP said, listen, it's an interesting strategy. You should pick one. So go ahead and, you know, and pick one. And I said, well, I'm African, you know, that's, you know, that's my heart. Let me, you know, that's what, you know, got me to where I was today. So let me go lean in on that. And so starting sort of 20, late 2011, 2012, I started paying attention to that and looking at that. So when we started, the real question was, what do you do in ecosystems that are not even emerging, but, you know, probably just nascent? You know, I mean, you know, talking 2012, this was sort of when, if I remember correctly, the conquers of the world and the, and the, you know, 
Jumias of the world were beginning to show up, uh, but no one was really paying attention. And, you know, and for a real viable ecosystem to work, you have to have a bunch of pieces that, you know, not just cohabit the ecosystem, but collaborate within the ecosystem. And of course, the key driver, of course, would be sort of entrepreneurial energy. Uh, but you also have to have things like, you know, a, a somewhat, you know, flexible regulatory environment and, you know, corporates that respected and understood innovation and adopted innovation where they could. Um, but, you know, most importantly, also having a pipeline, whether it came from academia or from research or whatever it is, to be able to fuel some of that local innovation. Well, we didn't have a lot of those, right? You know, you know, in Africa, instead of maybe more even in Nigeria, um, there was a lot of energy, um, but there wasn't as much, you know, of the rest of the stuff. You know, the corporate environment was, was, was somewhat anemic, at least when it came to pure innovation. And, you know, in some cases, actually much more predatory than, than, than necessary. And so, you know, the view was to now say, listen, what kinds of things could work in these markets? But more importantly, what kinds of markets could enable things? And, you know, and then it ended up that, you know, our view was you couldn't approach the, the Africa investing sort of, you know, thesis without building formal investment thesis that would support how you invest it. And the reason why is that, for instance, in, you know, when I lived in Palo Alto, um, I could sit down in my office and take meetings all day long with entrepreneurs who were coming up with ideas and concepts and, 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 and products. I mean, you just, you didn't even have, you didn't have time to form a thesis because there was just a ton of volume, right? This was just energy at its greatest. But in Nigeria, you know, what you found more consistently was that it was hard to think strategically and even in many cases think, you know, optimally, you know, in a tactical way, simply because there was just a, such a high coefficient of drag on everything you did. And so what we, what we then thought through was, okay, let's figure out fundamentally how we will go about assessing investments, assessing investment opportunities, and most importantly, how to think about the submarkets we wanted to attack. And so we then said, listen, and I'm going to answer both of your questions kind of in a blended way, I'll tell you, so, so we'll, we'll get to that. But we now said, listen, what does this market look like? We have energy, we have, we have a lot of young folks, we have a lot of self-driven folks and learners, and, um, and we were very excited. And this was before Canada became a thing. But we were very excited because we are like, listen, there's going to be a core group of folks here that uh, will form the ecosystem that we're so bullish about. So we said, okay, what's, what are the commonalities in the African ecosystem, you know, as, as an aggregate? The first thing was that, you know, talking about the coefficient of drag, um, it was very obvious that, you know, for whatever reasons, I mean, they've been, you know, one can make an argument that corruption fuels the drag because, the drag essentially generates the need for payouts and so on and so forth. But there was so much friction, you know, in a lot of the markets, you know, and, and to, to, to be clear, we did not include South Africa as, as what we were most interested in because we didn't think it was as underserved. I have come to believe that that's not true and it is still underserved. Uh, it's just not very visible. And so that's going to change going forward for us. Uh, but in a lot of the other markets, you know, friction was a thing, right? And for us, it meant, it meant that being able to frame a, a thesis leg around lubricants um, made sense. When you were thinking about, you know, technology-driven products and services that could eliminate or mitigate friction where you found it. So that was sort of one key leg. The second was that we also realized that while a lot of the what I'll call funding activity tended to be very grant driven and therefore much more philanthropically sourced. A lot of it was framed in, in sort of pure impact terms. And there's nothing wrong with framing anything in impact terms. My concern was that it started to fuel a research sort of, you know, a nice PowerPoint uh, ecosystem where folks who design beautiful graphs, 
you know, nicely colored, you know, presentations and talk about impact. And the impact would be like, hey, we did X and we created 3,000 jobs and people will clap wearing their fanciest tuxedos, you know, and they'll be like, oh my gosh, we're saving the people of Africa. Well, ignoring sort of the, the underlying sort of, you know, what I call, you know, deprecating approach to that, it was also more interesting to me that no one sort of unwrapped the whole concept of, of what this savior mentality looked like. And you had this 3,000 jobs, you know, it was great. You unpacked it and you realized that, for instance, in Nigeria, you create 3,000 jobs and, you know, and the people are making 10,000 naira a month. And I was like, well, that's a problem for, for us as a firm because, you know, Africa being sort of a very community-driven ecosystem, right, you didn't really find, like, say, in Sweden, where most of the people who live in Sweden, uh, you know, uh, single-person households. You know, you were carrying households. And, you know, and this 10,000 may look, you know, may not show up except in a footnote in a nice presentation, um, but it didn't really okay. do anything to lift the household. And so we essentially focused on, on this leg of a thesis that we called Lift. This was, you know, many years ago, and it's kind of interesting because Melinda Gates now has Lift as the title of her latest book. But it was one of those things where we're like, listen, you need to focus on Lift. And, you know, you were thinking sort of more broadly, and there were some subsectors like education and, you know, distributed education, for instance, um, in many cases, distributed health. But there was that, that was sort of the big opportunity, and no one was paying attention to it. The third, was what we, you know, sort of this thing, we, we've talked about this, I think, elsewhere. But the other observation, you sort of notice as well that a lot of the, the elements that supported that thesis were very observation driven, right? So it's not about going and reading some nice McKinsey research report and so on and so forth. No, I need to see exactly, you know, okay, aka, tell me who you are, you know, the way you act tells me who you are and not what you tell, yeah. right? And so, you know, we, we then realized that um, the, the biggest opportunity, especially when you, re, when you saw the fact that eventually people will figure out that Africa was interesting, else people from outside, particularly technology companies, those folks will come to the fight with, with literally, you know, first generation weapons, right? Just, you know, they will come in, they're coming in with capital, they're coming in with, with First class UX, UI, you know, software developers. And, you know, we're just out here just trying to sort of do our thing with, our, you know, with our bows and arrows and stuff. And um, so I was like, well, so what is the biggest element of what we can control locally? And I realized that because the mechanics of every sub-market in Africa looked very much like an iceberg, okay. right? So there was always 97% below the surface, 3% <laughs> above the surface. Yeah. You needed to be sort of be willing to swim, right? right? And you hold your breath underwater for as long as possible and the like. So it, it, it certainly it struck us that that innate ability, which was to be able to organize the offline or the below surface, was a local superpower. Like okay. there was no okay. way you could do it from San Francisco. It wasn't code that was going to get you to go and organize the Oshodi boys. It, like, there's no code you could write that would do that, right? And so, so we were now confident that organizing the offline was a fantastic way of building moats you know, for, for companies that then could put digital layers above them. And so and then the final thing, which I've talked about over the last sort of, you know, you know, six, eight weeks, has been this whole concept of anti-fragility. And this is, sort of brings us to this, this conversation today. Okay. Africa is a, a set of mixed metaphors, right? So you talk about icebergs and, and the like, and you, you, you talk about disorder, you talk about chaos, and yet you talk about this organization even within that disorder and chaos. And okay. what was most okay. interesting was that, you know, you know, I love Nassim Taleb and you know, a lot of his philosophies, but, you know, the, his book on anti-fragility and that ability to build or enable or empower anti-fragility, which is your ability, your superpower to thrive within disorder or chaos, struck me as a very African thing. Okay. Right? 
And, you know, to a certain degree, you know, that you can sort of see it in other emerging markets, but, you know, the subject is Africa. And, and, I, and it, you know, we were very clear that this was going to be, as, as hard as you would say it, our superpower, the ability to thrive in disorder and chaos and to find okay. some sort of organization. You know, people have asked, well, what kind of examples and so on and so forth. And you hear things like, hey, listen, we wrote this report and, you know, you know, we have X percent of people that are unbanked and we need to save them by giving them bank accounts. And I'm thinking they don't want you to save them. They're fine. It's working. You have these entire concept of parallel economies. You can enter by local market or tell market and there's an entire, there's an entire financial services economy inside the market. Yeah. Right. So if it's is it loans, if it's this, if it's that, it's all there. Right. And so, you know, they're not looking for you to come in and bring the savior mentality into the mix. They have learned how to persist and, and thrive even without within that disorder and chaos. And, and so right. that anti-fragility has been sort of a watchword for us um, because we also recognize that folks who have sort of what I call, a, you know, the high resolution understanding of these customers and how they think yep. and how they act and what they need and what they prioritize is what will separate the entrepreneurs that will create the biggest companies from the rest of them. Because, you know, like I said, what we have found consistently, and, you know, we like to say we invest in secrets, but, you know, fundamentally what that means, we like entrepreneurs who have discovered a secret nobody else has. And there are okay. so many of those opportunities in Africa. And, you know, you're thinking, oh, you know, it's small and so on and so forth. I'm like, you're not thinking like the Valley. The Valley tells you that, oh, we only like billion dollar opportunities. Um, and I'm like, you're right. That makes sense because of all the capital you put into these companies. But when you realize that a lot of the really quality entrepreneurs can attack two, four, five hundred million dollar opportunities, get to those opportunities with two or three or four million dollars and dominate Right, you then yeah. realize they're actually better off than you know, and they'll still own most of their companies. Gotcha. Right at okay. the end of the day, right? And so, so a lot of it is just is is really it, it really comes down to that ability to find entrepreneurs that have a high resolution understanding of their market and okay. the ability to build the product, but then most importantly, deliver a product that doesn't make too many promises. But the promises it makes, it always delivers. Okay. And in, in an environment where there's a deficit of trust, the initial reaction is, I don't believe you. Interesting. Yeah. You know, and you know, the classic saying in Nigeria, you don't mean it. It's not, <laughs> you know, you have to think about it. And when you unpack it, you realize, no, actually, I, I, I think you're just talking shit. That, like, like, that's my instant reaction to everything you come at me with. Right. Okay. And so then you now say, in fact, I do mean it. Right. And, and, and as we tell entrepreneurs all the time, you don't make too many promises. You can make one, two or three products and, you know, experience promises, but just fulfill them. So, yeah, because at the end of the day, when you find customers is to retain them. And what you want to do is to deliver on your promise every day. So let me just pull out a few themes that I've noted, that I've noted. So you're saying don't make too many promises. I assume that's both to the customer and to your investors. Right. We're not going to build unicorns like the same way you build them in Silicon Valley. We're going to take a lot less capital than you might take in Silicon Valley, but we're going to build companies that deliver multiples, perhaps higher multiples than you might even get over there, two, three million dollars and build a 200, 300 million dollar company. Right. Um, you've talked about local talent and the understanding of the local markets as a really key superpower for yeah. entrepreneurs. And those are the things that you look at when you are making an investment. Right. Now, what's interesting about that is one of my follow-up questions the future look like, or how's that thesis, how's your thesis affected by COVID-19? But if I think about what you've just said, it doesn't necessarily change. That local understanding is still critical. Yes. That man is still a superpower. I think you and I talk used to battling through things. Our customers are already used to battling through rough economies. And so this is one more bump, a big one, but it's just one more bump. Yeah, instead of uh, just another Monday, it's just another Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to like, I, I mean, that's fantastic because it allows me to actually like jump over a few questions. I will pick on some 
ask a little bit more, you just speak a little bit more about it. You talked about while you were at Intel, trying to figure out what the future would look like. And so it looked like the internet. It looked like certain classes of products. So let me say today, if you're looking at Africa, whether in aggregate or country by country, what would you say the future looks like? You know, what matters? What industries matter? What sectors matter? Where, where are the growth opportunities? What are the areas we should invest energy and time in and money in as entrepreneurs, as investors? It's an excellent question. You will notice that when I walked you through the four legs of my investment thesis, I never talked about a sector. No, you didn't, which is part of why the question. Yeah, because <laughs> it's sector independent. Okay. It is fundamentally around using a different lens to evaluate the opportunities. Okay. So if you think about lubricants as an investment thesis, and the next step will be where do I see friction? Yeah. It's sector agnostic. Gotcha. If you think about organizing the offline as a thesis and you're like, so where do I see that? You're like, hmm, I could see it in Cars 45 that we invested in, right? Okay. It's an interesting example, Printivo, yep. which was essentially a blend of lubricants taking friction out of the print process and organizing what was a very fragmented print segment. You could pick up examples all the time. Hotels at NG, just organizing the offline. Yeah. Right? So, so a lot of it is not about let me go pick a specific sector. And I know people want to hear that. Like, tell me where I need to be spending my money. And they're thinking in sector terms. Gotcha. Like, it's, I, you know, and that's fine. I mean, people like sit down and say, I want to focus on healthcare. I want to focus on transportation. I want to focus on commerce or media. And that's great. Right? But we're saying, listen, we have these specific lenses that we use to evaluate the match between the entrepreneur, the product, and the market. And to a large degree, if those three things don't coalesce in some very sort of non, you know, if they don't coalesce in an obvious way or, or not, you have to pause and ask yourself, is this the time? Okay. Right? So, so, you know, I'll give you a classic example. I think in one of, if maybe the last webinar I did, I got asked about ed tech. And I started to talk through how we thought about ed tech. And... And we think about it in itself a very counterintuitive way, which is what are the fundamental underpinnings? Ignore the sort of user layer, the software layer, yeah. ignore all of that. What are the fundamental underpinnings of being able to deliver ed tech in a non friction type of mode? People are like, well, you know, you know, is it maybe it's your type of phone, your your tablet? I'm like, no, it's accessibility, it's connectivity. I mean, like, I have not even gotten to the software layer. So now you now say, okay, so let's wind back. We're not geniuses, we're just saying we ask questions and we we love to ask dumb questions. So we're now in lockdown mode. And tell me the number one source of complaints from parents, other than the fact that they realize that their, their teachers are underpaid because parents are literally now figuring out that, my goodness, I don't even know who these children are. And I don't know why I have them and why they're in my house and they're giving me all this. <laughs> um, but ignore, ignoring that, you know, people are like, hey, listen, you know, you want my kid to be online from 8 to 2 p.m., you know, who's going to pay for that data? Yeah. Right. And then, the kid is on there and the thing starts to break up. Yep. Right? So what it then does, which is just horrific, is that the people in the household that are the spenders that will commit the funds that will drive your revenues as an ed tech platform are frustrated with the experience. Yeah. It has nothing to do with you, the ed tech provider, but you will bear the consequences. Yeah. Right. So once you now realize that, then what I'm trying to figure out from you is how are you thinking about the product design, okay. knowing those constraints. Okay. Right. All right. What are you? How? And so that's that. So it's it's really not about uh, picking ed tech as a sector, and ed tech is always interesting. But but that's one of those things that you run into where you're like, listen, I need to solve for that. So one of the things we so did. So you entrepreneur, how are you solving that specific friction? How are you removing that friction? Yes. How are you solving the problems that are making a sector not work? Exactly. And using technology 
Exactly. And using your local knowledge, your understanding of the local landscape. Correct. Okay, I think that's really interesting. I'm going to jump into some questions that the audience asked before we started this conversation. One of them is around, well, so if for the entrepreneurs, it's another day at work, you just got to, another, COVID is another bump. For the customer, COVID is... Yeah, COVID is a punch for the customer, not a bump. But how about for investors? So for your LPs, thinking about investing in Africa, for funds, what does this change? You know, what does the next, what does the next you know, year look like from an investor perspective? So that's a good question. There are two buckets of things investors face. One will be risk and the other will be uncertainty. I can always price risk. I cannot model for uncertainty. And COVID has introduced dramatic uncertainty. Okay. So how do you address uncertainty? You pause until you can get a better read based on your, based on your experience of what to do moving forward. So I think a lot of well, it is have paused yeah. and okay. there's nothing wrong with that because they're, you know, they're, you know, fiduciaries, they're custodians of capital and you can't be reckless with that. And until they get a better feel for the risk without uncertainty, you know, nothing happens. Gotcha. Now yeah. that's, you know, so for those who are investing in Africa on the LP side, limited partners that want to give money to funds like us to deploy. So there's that. What, you also find at the fund manager side is that, again, you know, they're reporting to their own investors, the LPs, and, you know, the LPs want to know, one, how is the existing portfolio doing? Before you start thinking about how I need to buy and find new deals, tell me how was the health of this portfolio. And unfortunately for us, um, the way COVID has hit, it kind of has straddled two quarters. Yes. Right? So <laughs> you're going to find companies that will probably do okay in Q1. Yeah. Um, and will get absolutely hammered in Q2. Right? Yeah. So, you know, a lot, of, a lot of what you do as a fund manager is to ensure that you can – provide some sort of soft landing for these companies, these founders, the managers, the employees, navigate sort of what this post-COVID world looks like and the like. But the truth is, as a fund manager, you got to go back to your office and say, listen, my Q1 was pretty decent. I haven't, my Q2 is going to be just garbage based on what I can see today. So I need to sort of figure this stuff out. And, you know, you know, and, you know as much as you, know, you, you, you hate to say this, Fund managers also have to do triage, right? Yep. Which is exactly the same model you see in the ER, which is some folks need to head to the OR immediately. Some folks can sit in the ER for a little while uh, and some can just get treated right there and just start, right? So, so there is, the, and some will go to the morgue, right? So there is, there is that process that has to happen. Um, but I think generally speaking, you know, if I told, if I could sort of detect sentiment on the, LP side, yeah. I think the sentiment is, you know, everything comes to pause, everything, right? You know, until there's better visibility, which will probably be next month or June, there's just almost going to be no activity, right? And, you know, I'm, and it's an interesting view, again, because, you know, I've, I've done this two sort of significant recessions, you know, prior to this one, and I, you know, and I was trained at Intel, which you know, had a philosophy, which was that, you know, when everybody's slowing down, that is when you're going to separate yourself. So you need to focus on separating yourself okay. when everybody's slowing down. And I take that philosophy with me every day. Let but me, let me just, I want to pause you for a moment. Yeah. And say, so as an entrepreneur, I understand that. I'm like, some of my competition is going to go down right now. I got to stay alive. I got to stay pushing, which should be delivering more. So I understand that. Now, as an investor, how do you think about that? So, I mean, we talked about this, like uh, the framing of this conversation is the bull case for investing in Africa yeah. right now. And I've got a question from a Ghanaian entrepreneur named Wisdom about how we can apply for funding from you. Now, from what I've heard you say just now, you are triaging your existing portfolio. You are watching to understand how the game of, um, changes, but I guess, the question is, why is this a great time to invest? You know, 
is it, is it a great time to invest? Or is six months from now a great time to invest? Is three months from now a great time to invest? But why, you know, what's, what's the bull case? The bull case, I think, is really simple. That is, when you have a window, yeah. right? it could be a three-month window, it could be a six-month window, it could be a nine-month window, right? But if you're investing in high-quality entrepreneurs, you know they're going to go out there and execute at a pace, which means that that six-month or nine-month window is the fuel they will need to separate the company, yes. right? So it's not really around saying, hey, listen, let's just rush and do this stuff. Um, and I, you know, I think a lot of folks will know that the deals that are getting done now or getting announced have been in place since, right? Six months, yeah, nine months, right? Yeah. So it's not like people said, oh, COVID and jumping into deals. I mean, that's happening, anyway, but not really. So why is it the best time to invest? Well, a few things. One, you've got attention at the consumer okay. and SMB level. You've got attention. All right. F folks are now moving. Okay. You know, I was saying something yesterday. Yeah. I'll call him and she's like, oh, you know, you know, when is he going to be available? I'm like, let me tell you, I know he's at home. So I would call him. <laughs> I, yeah, know I find people are scheduling a calls with me now because they're like, what you know, I'm like <laughs> yes, I know exactly where he is right now, right? So, yeah. so you've got attention, right? And, you know, I, 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 I sent a note to um, a group of investors and entrepreneurs and it was sort of, you know, the, the, you know about how you think counterintuitively even in these times. And I said, listen, okay. you know, I'm seeing entrepreneurs saying, listen, I need to, you know, cut back on the headcount. So, of course, the softest and easiest and, you know, lowest hanging fruit is marketing, right? Yeah. And so you, you cut back the marketing. And my, my advice to them was, listen, don't cut too deep. And the reason why is that because of the specific environment we're in now, where there's a lot of stress and concern and in many cases, sorrow and uncertainty. As a company, your responsibility will be to make a case to not be forgotten. And that's very, very important because fundamentally, customers, consumers, Consumers, businesses, whatever it is, it, you know, because again, being sort of in an emotional state means, you know, that you remember you keep marketing. If you're not clever with the way you sort of figure out how to remind people of what you do and the product you serve to them, um, you will get forgotten when everything comes back to, well, the new normal. And so I think it's important to do counterintuitive things like that. And it's the same thing where people say, hey, listen, you know, you're investing now. The truth is for the quality companies that have figured out the unit economics, figured out how to serve these customers, have a true high resolution understanding of it. And I'm not, you know, I'm not really trying to, you know, they're not swinging for the fences, looking for the big rounds, but they're just like, listen, I'm going to raise a small round. I'm going to execute this. I'm going to get to these milestones. That's, those are the companies that will get that will get funded, even despite the slowdown. You know, and and I think finally, um, you know, there's there's always that concern about what does it take to get funded. Uh, you know, um, people and investors are going to be um, predatory. Uh, I think there's always that fear. I think based on what we're hearing from our friends in the U.S. The U.S. is playing a very interesting PR game on the startup side because I know for a fact deals that are getting done at high liquidation preferences. People will come and talk on Twitter like, oh, everybody's doing normal, but it's not true. Um, and so, you know, we've always been big fans of remove the complexity deal terms and just, you know, if the valuation is the problem, then fix the valuation, come to some agreement, and, you know, live to fight another day as an entrepreneur. Um, if dilution is your concern, figure out how to raise less money to, you know, to do more. So those are the kinds of things that, you know, come up in these conversations. And, um, you know, but I, you know, like I say, you know, the good investors who have clearly thought through what they're doing um, are still going to be open to investing. It might take a little bit longer, um, but, you know, have those conversations anyway.
Uh, but I, I think as, as an entrepreneur, going to those conversations um, with, with sort of more pragmatic, you know, uh, objectives, um, you know, you, you know, now for a lot of folks, and this is sort of something we'll talk about as well, um, for a lot of folks, it, you know, we are going to get, I think, a very different view going forward about how execution is going to happen. And, you know, and, and there's always this underlying risk in, in, in Africa that can make, you know, when people are doing comparables and saying, hey, listen, my, my comparable competitor in the U.S. is only that X or Y. You know, one of the things I keep talking about is, yes, but when you look at your competitors upside, it's also 200X or 1,000Y. And ours in our market, maybe 15X or 20X or 30Y. Uh, so it's not quite the same. And, and so they're not actually comparables, you know. But then, you know, the other big problem again is, you know, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to see it a lot more going forward this year because of the contraction. I mean, I think the World Bank is suggesting Africa's the combined African GDP contraction should be sort of 5% or something, uh, which is very high. Um, and it takes a while to recover. Uh, but one of the things you will, you will find out as you, as you, as you keep engaging is that um, the risk of devaluation for a lot of these countries in Africa will be high. And so, you know, the other thing I'll tell entrepreneurs is be careful about how um, I give an example in, in, a, in an interview I, I, I gave, um, which is interesting. I, I used a dramatic example of a company that did $10 million in revenues last year. And, um, and so they were like, hey, we did $10 million and and, and they raised money at, you know, let's assume a 1x multiple. Uh, so it was $10 million valuation. Then at the end of this year, uh, the Naira gets adjusted, at the beginning of this year or thereabouts, the Naira gets adjusted, not devalued, very important, it wasn't devalued, it was adjusted from, you know, 306 to 380. And so what's fascinating about that example is that when you, if you, when that same company at the end of the year does $10 million again in revenues. Now, it doesn't seem like that was a huge achievement since they did 10 million last year, but when the rest of the market is down 50% and you're not, you're flat, you know, flat is new up. So you now say, I want to go raise money again, but because your revenues are in Naira, your $10 million of last year is $7.2 million at the end of this year. And all of a sudden, it's a very different business from a valuation perspective, right? And so these are the things that you try to sort of caution people to think through because what would then end up is that your investor that came in at a $10 million valuation and at the end of the year is seeing you stay flat to revenues, but now your revenues end up being $7.2 million. It's a down round. It's not, that's not interesting, right? So, I mean, I'm not saying I know how to solve that, but it's just, it's, it's fascinating to see the, the, some of the risk of tying your valuations to your U.S., you know, comparables when, you know, your currency is dropping. Um, you know, some of you know this, but, you know, I'm using 380 as the number. Um, you know, the number on the street is probably north of 420. Um, and, you know, the 12-month, you know, non deliverable forward struck 499 right so you know again if i use that example and say you know you were 10 million dollars at 306 you're 7.2 million dollars at 380 i have no idea i can't even do the math right now what's your 499 right and you know and everything has gone to hell and you're staying flat you've done fantastic and your valuation is just dropping because of the dollar terms that's it so so that's i think Partially the reason why, you know, I, I tell entrepreneurs, listen, this, you know, there's no better time now, right? A lot of the folks who will have been starting because everybody was sort of excited about getting into investing and so on and so forth, which is good, by the way, because certainly between when we started investing in, in Africa and now, the angels have kind of come out, 
right? This is, you know, they now start to think, oh, this IP digital thing could be interesting. So folks are raising money. But, you know, be careful because know that, you know, how you're sailing into the wind is going to be a very important element of whether or not you're going to be able to raise again, right? So, you know, the currency drag is a big problem, right? So you need yeah. to be able to say, I, I know this business. I know this customer. I know how I can monetize this customer. Yeah. And you just have to take, you know, you have to sit down and say, I'm going to do a whole, whole lot more with a whole lot less and just go out there and execute and not focus on anybody else distracting you or the like because the business is going to change. You know, I talk, talked a lot about the evolution of fintech companies. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, you're seeing sort of, you know, very interesting numbers out there, folks, you know, but folks that then realize, hey, listen, you know, you know, I want, I, you know, I started up doing X in financial services, but boy, these remittances, man, there's a lot of margin in that thing. I can make more money. I can satisfy my investors. And so they now say, okay, we're all piling on some remittances. And um, they, guess what? That market is going away. I mean, not totally. Yeah. But for the next year, the people, yeah. because the people who do the remittances will disproportionately be impacted in the countries that they are. These opportunities that are showing up now are yeah. incredible. Incredible. And okay. we've seen, you know, we invested in a company um, last year. You know, I think they did about $2, two million yeah. in revenues. Last okay. year, um, did like five in Q1. Oh, wow. That's growth. That's real I mean, growth. Oh, yeah. And we're like, okay. <laughs> you know, okay. So these, these, these opportunities continue to exist. But, you know, I like to caution entrepreneurs, right? You know, again, think deeply about the, the product and the market. Think deeply. It's not that... You know, like people are like, oh my gosh, FinTech is crowded. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it is crowded. Or maybe it's crowded with a lot of mediocre experiences. Fair enough. Right? Healthcare, very few people have been doing anything in healthcare, right? Okay. And, and you know, everybody, again, yeah, this is sort of an interesting example. So when everybody thinks about healthcare, they think about the big swings. Or oh, let's go do electronic medical records, let's do this, let's do that, right? Um, and, you know, when we invested in Temi in Life Bank, you know, it was just one of those random things that people were like, that can't be that big a market. Ah, it's, it's, you know, how big is blood? Yep. I could tell you, I could tell you how big blood is, but, you know, that, that, that would be telling. Um, <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> you know, but... It's, it's stuff like that, where you find entrepreneurs finding secret markets, um, they can go ahead and dominate. And so I, you know, I'm telling entrepreneurs and I'm telling my fellow VCs, you know, we have a webinar, you know, essentially encouraging people, don't quit, don't stop investing. You know, now, you know, set higher standards for what you're expecting for the entrepreneurs and how they're gonna need to use the money that you invest in them. But don't stop investing. There are all kinds of things. You're watching, I'll give another example. When in, in tough economies, what usually happens is that everybody leaves consumer and they all want to sort of get into, they all sort of want to get into, sort of, you know, what I'll call the sure cases. So business to business and the like. Yeah. The challenge with business opportunities is that the feedback loop is much larger and much longer, right? So it takes okay. a longer sales cycle. And the fact of the matter is that you, you essentially defer the bad news. But when it shows up, it shows up with VEX, right? So the consumer opportunities are there. Uh, but okay. you know, I, I, know that, I know that entrepreneurs are like, well, it's really hard to raise money for that and so on and so forth. Don't worry. We're telling our fellow investors, look at consumer. But... There's something we like to do. You know, we're very proud of the fact that, you know, one third of our portfolio is woman founded. And we want to increase that as much as possible. Um, but, you know, part of how, part of why I think we're successful at that is that we normalize the entry point. So, okay. so you're coming to the website 
look like, what you're wearing, none of that nonsense that investors apparently get confused by. We just look at you, your background, your business, and the opportunity. And if we like it, we engage. Now, I always tell entrepreneurs, we, we see okay. the way we work that questionnaire, everybody in okay. the team sees the questionnaire. So, sees the, sort of sees the output. So it's not, it doesn't get stuck with one person or whatever, no. Everybody sees it when it comes in. And then, you know, there's interest and someone says, hey, listen, that, that's interesting. Or, hey, that's an interesting fit with X or Y, or something we're discussing, then we engage. But we, you know, people are like, you know, and there's also another interesting thing about what we do. Um, we, you know, we, so we, we, you know, we sort of okay. do counter narratives. So we have invested in entrepreneurs that reach out to us cold on the website. Okay. For sure. Not just once. We've invested in entrepreneurs that are right. open okay. office hours. Now, what are the metrics you consider for these investments? Like, what makes you excited about someone who's coming in? Um, the thesis is right, it fits your thesis, but what makes you say this is something we should jump on? And uh, that's uh, amazing asking that question. So, it's a good question because it's usually a blend of a secret. And okay, <laughs> all right. And a with or without entrepreneur. Okay. So with or so without entrepreneur, entrepreneur is usually the entrepreneur where you you interact with him or her, and you know there's one in particular that I'm just thinking about. Actually, there's a whole bunch of data portfolio, but you're just like, holy smokes, this person is going to do this thing, yeah, with or without us. Gotcha. Right, and we have a bunch of them, you know. Okay. And you know, Temi was one of them. You just, you know, I, you know, it's, it's consistent with I think entrepreneurs that end up being fully or quasi mission driven, and not those who you just you know, walk away thinking, yeah, this one just wants to hammer. It's not to say that that's actually a that's there's nothing wrong with that, but the challenge that we found historically is that when you have folks who want to hammer they tend to have a tougher time navigating through the valleys of the process. How can you apply for funding pre-seed from me? Um, well, usually we don't, really, we don't really play in the pre-seed market. We used to uh, when we started because no one was really doing it. Now it feels like there's a, there's a, fair, there's a fairly active pre-seed market in, in, in Nigeria um, or, or wherever you are. I mean, certainly some countries is less so than others. Um, but you know, best way again is to come into the website, you know, submit, you know, the, the questionnaire and then we'll take a look at it. Um, someone asked about ed tech B2C, um, you know, targeting senior secondary school students. Here's the thing about ed tech. Ed tech is again, a three point triangle. Um, there's parents, there's teachers and there's students. But here's the problem. There's only one point of the triangle that has the, that will support your revenue analysis, and that's the parent side. And so, you know, you can sort of try to acquire the students, but to keep them and to monetize them, you have to convince the parents. And so when you say you're targeting students, that might be how you're serving, but really who you're targeting is who, who has the, the pockets. Um, Another question, how can one start angel investing in Nigeria, Abuja? Uh, this is a great question. The, um, you know, there's the Lagos Angel Network. There's also a new group, you know, that we like a lot, the Abuja Angels Network. Um, come back to Tomi and I'll send you a link to the person who you should talk to in Abuja. Um, good question. Um, what do you believe is a window of opportunity for Africans to invest in Africa before someone else comes along and does it? It's an excellent question. Listen, one big risk that we face right now, and I don't think I really talked about it, and why I'm also very excited about, about Africa, is that I am worried about the resiliency of the American consumer and the American business. Um, I mean, they will talk it up because, you know, they're very good at PR and hype. But I just think they're going to be in a tough place for a long time. And capital always looks for vacuums and always looks for opportunities. So it is, in fact, possible 
that, you know, in the next six months, nine months, once people realize the U.S. is not it for a while, it starts looking elsewhere. And, and that's going to benefit the African entrepreneur. Uh, but at the same time, you've got to make sure that, you know, if you are doing the right thing in the right place and you're able to attract these foreign investments, you need to be completely pragmatic about how, how you raise it because it will turn on you in a heartbeat. It has done that now. This is what they do. The minute there's something that's exciting them, they'll just forget about you because you were always an interesting sort of experiment. So Africans investing in Africa is, is I think you should see more of it. I, I don't think there's been a really good way of thinking about vehicles to get people to invest in these things. Um, but also, it's also a function of risk. Um, we're not as, as, we're not as big a set of risk takers as we like to pride ourselves, right? Because if we were, fewer people would be buying those you know, CBN treasuries, um, you know? And, and so, you know, people are like, give me that guarantee. And I'm thinking, okay, that's great. You know, you get your, you know, 9% or 11%, which is fantastic, a fantastic return anywhere. You know, when you juxtapose it with your inflation rate of 15, then you're like, oh, you're actually losing money. But, you know, let's not get into those details. Um, but it is important to figure out exactly how to think about vehicles to allow people to invest once they recognize the, 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 the risk profile. Um, someone asked about investment in the automotive value chain that's tech-based. Tech um, as a matter of fact, this is kind of counterintuitive and, and you know, a few examples of how we think. In prior recessions, what always happened was automotive dealers of new cars struggled. Automotive repair shops thrived. Because the decision to change your car in five years became, oh, you know what, let me just struggle with this for another two years or three years. And so that's always the counterintuitive way you think about people coming out of recessions. Now, this recession has been also interesting because in the U.S., um, while automotive sales have cratered, automotive loans are holding up because people with higher credit scores who probably are further away from being hit by job loss or whatever it is, are recognizing that there's an opportunity to buy cars at a significant discount. So the loan, automotive loan sector is seeing volume with average, high average credit scores applying for loans. And you know, these this car companies are giving eight, nine year, 10 year loans now, which is insane, you know, at 0%. And you know, of course, those who have higher credit scores by definition, of, you know, tend to be a little bit financially smarter. They're like, hey, you're gonna give me a car at a discount with 0% for eight years, you know, I'll take it. Right, so there's, there's that. So, but, but those types of things are interesting and counterintuitive as you think about building a network. So yeah, that could be actually viable. Here's a simple question. How do you triage limited funds for your, for your startup portfolio right now? <laughs> because it's a challenge we're facing. Who gets what? Is there a way of saying, okay, these guys are gonna make it and these guys aren't, and by the way, these guys are in between. Is there anything we can use to think through that process? Yeah, so Thanks, it's an interesting question because it does, it does require, I think, a somewhat Darwinian lens on the, the state of your portfolio. And I, I think the first thing you need to ask yourself, so I always tell folks who are coming out to raise seed in this market that the case you have to make as a founder is why why you should be entitled to survive. Hmm. Because there are some businesses that you're like, listen, it's done. Like even if it comes, even if we come out tomorrow, done. So if you're an investor in a restaurant, hmm. all I can tell you is, unless you are doing arm robot work on the side, Done. <laughs> Forget it, yeah. Right? So you have to have that analysis, first of all, which is who deserves to live longer and under what circumstances. 
and what is the service they have to provide to be able to do that. It's a very tough thing because, you know, you've got to bring empathy in it, but you also have to be very clear eyed about it. Mm -hmm. So if you are in the events business, that's a tough business because no one knows what that's going to look like going forward. Mm. So what we were doing was, Hey, listen, we have an exposure in the events business. Okay. So what happens if the events business goes online 70 or 80%, what would you need to do with your product? Come back and make the case. Mm. Can you be a gatekeeper for that? Is there a way you can create those things? Is there a way you can sort of assemble, you know, customers for it? So then all of a sudden, your events business that you will have written off starts to look interesting. <laughs> okay, what do you need to sort of extend the runway to go explore that? Because I believe in that. It takes, oh, give half of your money money to the ones that are igniting and so on and so forth. Now, it's actually done on a case-by-case -case basis because as you evaluate the business together with the founder and you figure out what the founder is trying to figure out, then you're like, listen, do I believe this? Which is the same model you use when you were investing at the onset. Do I believe it or do I not? If I don't believe it, you know, you're just going to have a very serious conversation about, you know, we can't allocate any money to you because, I mean, the truth is, as, as terse as it sounds, you just it'll be throwing good money after bad at that point, mm -hmm. right? So you just better take the impairment and move on to fight another day to something else than to sort of put money into that. And it's not a failure because the truth is everybody's is hammered, right? The very best companies are hammered. I mean, Booking.com, which I think is one of the best executing companies in the world, says they were gonna run out of cash next year. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so those are the conversations, right? And you're going to find the ones that will do well, what I call the, the COVID bump. Mm -hmm. um, and that's great, you know, the numbers are up, but you now have to ask yourself, does this business persist after things sort of kind of settle? You know, so everybody's excited about e-commerce and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I always like to say, you know, don't be in a business where you're only up because the customer has no choice. It's the same thing with some of the ed tech guys. You know, everybody's like, oh man, we're blowing up and this and that. I'm like, okay, this is fantastic. So what's the difference between now and before? The product hasn't changed, right? It still sucks. But people are using it because they don't have any optionality. When the optionality is get the kids into the car and get them to school, they, they won't remember who you are. You be calling them for say, oh, a guy you ask money, they be like, "Okay, oh, guy's not on seat." It will be depressing on be a guy that will tell you that they're not on seat. So it's 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 things like that where you've got to take a three sixty degree mm. view of again, what rights will this business have to succeed? There's one question yeah, I just please. saw. I want to take immediately, which is is from an pay me, John. And it goes, okay. a lot of the investment criteria I mentioned are not quantifiable. Yeah. Are there standards that need to be met? So yeah, that's a great question. Okay. And here's how we look at it. You will see some VCs who say, listen, I don't, I'm not going to talk to you until you, are, you have X, you know, you have 100 million naira in revenues or 300 million naira in revenues or whatever it is, right? Um, we are kind of stage agnostic investors. So the fact that if you are doing, if you, if you have, if you're a high quality founder doing, you know, you know, very mission driven, doing something you think is very interesting and you fill out the stuff and, you know, whether or not you have $10,000 in revenues or a million dollars in revenues, we like interesting companies doing interesting things. I've used that phrase many over the years. And so I wouldn't necessarily say, oh, you have to have X million dollars in revenue, which is what people tell. No, I just need to believe that even if you're not there today, you will be there tomorrow. And, and we've done that. You know, we've invested in companies that have $5,000 in total revenue, $8,000 in revenue. We've invested in companies, you know, that are doing $60 million in revenue now. So it, 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 is, it, is, it is pretty open. The real question is, if, you know, do you fit in when you sort of, are you able to tell your story in a way that sort of shares with us 
why you are doing what you're doing and why it's interesting and why it's going to be, you know, a potentially venture style return. Okay. Um, I have one question I thought was interesting, which is, doesn't solving some of the core problems take away from the mission your company is facing? Now, um, I'll just explain. I think that was why we were having the conversation earlier about removing fictions. Um, but I think what the person is asking um, is about the fact that sometimes you're solving what feel like basic infrastructure problems, yes. like internet yes. and or power, and doesn't that take away from trying to build a successful company? Oh, um, and I think I have a, I think I know the answer to that, but um, yeah. please you address it. It's an excellent question yeah. um, because it's, it's part of that chaos that yeah. we deal with. And understanding the local environment. Yeah, it's part of that chaos, you know. And, you know, I'll give an example of what, of what we've learned, right? So if you had told me a year ago that Nigerian yeah. uh, um, employers would permit working from home, I would have been like, yeah. no, because they don't trust their employees and they think their employees are faffing off and doing all these things, yeah. right? And I bet you that's going to change going forward. Yeah. People are now realizing, oh, it is interesting. You can actually do the stuff effectively. You don't have to be in the office every day. So that's one thing, right? Now, you then, you know, like for instance, when we're thinking about it, you know, for our portfolio companies, one thing that showed up was, why do people not like to work from home? So it's not that the employers, you know, are like, okay, they were like, hey, yo, okay, now you can work from home if you want. But then everybody keeps showing up to work yep. and you ask why. But guess Power. what? The generator in my, in my complex only goes on at 7 p.m. Yep. It goes up at 7 a.m. Uh, Wi-Fi, the free Wi-Fi, very different. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the booker that I could just go to and get something small for 600, I don't have anything near that in my house like that. So there are all these sort of elements of it that, you know, change the way, you, the dynamics of, of the effectiveness of that. So I think, I think you're, you're, you're right. But, you know, that's why many of us should not be entrepreneurs. Because if you're not, you know, if you're not going to be able to accept and deal with that and get around it, then, it, then being a is not your should not be your career goal. It's just, but you know, I use this phrase, this uh, Chinese phrase, um, eating bitterness. And Say that again, eating in bitterness. Eating bitterness. Gotcha. You have to be able to eat Love it. it. Love it. I mean, because it's partially it. how you control it. I'm definitely going to use that. That's so very, it's very not. Easy. It's not. You know, you can sit yeah. and say, ah, my power, this and my power, that. You know, you're right. But guess what? You're you're, you're not alone. And if you are alone then maybe you should move. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, what's the average time in horizon for you making an investment, uh, someone's asked, and also sort of what exit strategies do you think are most valuable or viable for investors in African businesses? That's in America, what you could. Okay, that, um, so the timelines can be everything. Um, but usually we're finding that at least prior to COVID, but usually, yeah, 90, 120 days. But I, I, I do think, though, that you, you'll find now that no one's in any real rush. Um, yep. So as an entrepreneur, just get ready to maintain multiple conversations, but don't put your heart into any of them, really, because you will know when someone really likes what you're doing and stays engaged. Um, you know, now there's a lot more ghosting than, 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 than before. Um, I think this might be... Ah, so I think the last thing I'd love you to answer is around exit strategy. Yes, so there's uh, that. Yeah. So let me... Let me there's, there's a question in, in the audience, and I wanted to address that. Uh, someone goes, and of course it was anonymous, which is funny. Uh, someone goes, maybe I'm late, but I also promised to make a case for being bullish in Africa. I haven't heard the case yet. So... That's one person's view, you know, I'm sure others may have a different view, but let me sort of summarize what the case is. One, Africa, and I'm going to use this very generically because it is for four countries, I know that, uh, but the fact of the matter is that anti-fragility is the case for why Africa 
is more interesting than anywhere else. Yeah. I talked a little bit about my concern about the American consumer, the American small or medium sized business, and maybe to a lesser degree, the European small or medium sized business and consumer. But I just, I am very nervous about the resiliency of those, of those sub segments and how yeah. quickly they're going to come back. So when you look around, you have to ask yourself, where should capital be deployed? And my view is capital should chase anti-fragility. And that exists in spades in Africa. Now, maybe it's also the time, you know, to attract the capital to remove some of these elements of friction, whether it's infrastructure based or otherwise. But the demand, the thirst for digital services for well-priced, well-distributed, you know, trust never been higher. And it's in every sector of the economy you could think about. Is it health? Yeah, everybody talk about health. Is it, is it media? People are looking to consume as much content as they can find. I mean, think just, is it ag? Absolutely. There's people doing lots of things. And they don't always have to be digital to be interesting to you, right? There's just big businesses that are waiting to be built, looking for the support from investors to do it. And the key takeaway from that is go support these entrepreneurs, but make sure that they can make a case for their integrity. Because over and over and over again, what trumps, trumps everything else is entrepreneurial integrity, the ability to say what they're going to do and, they, and if they don't, they come back and tell you versus trying to sort of cut corners and make yeah. money on top of your head. If they make money, it should be with you. Now, to your question about viable exit strategies, it's an interesting one because in the US, um, I talked a little bit about it with someone yesterday, the typical venture return is what they call power law distribution, which is you end up being one of 10 or two of 10 that return the entire fund plus. Now, okay. that means that that power law is event driven. It is an yep. acquisition on IPO. Yep. If you call the number of acquisitions that have happened in Africa, if I bring out my fingers and my toes, I don't know if I will get to all of them. <laughs> That's okay. a problem. Yep. If you look at the public markets as an exit, I mean, all the fact that I don't have a lot of liquidity, you know, the truth of the matter is that a lot of the public markets, maybe except Johannesburg Stock Exchange, you know, are kind of anemic, right? And yeah. so, you know, what you then find as an investor is that while people come and say, well, we want American terms and so on and so forth, the American context is not the same, right? It's just not the same. So you're looking for companies that, lo and behold, would do things like get to profitability, which, by the way, you notice no one could spell in America until the last six months. Then all of a sudden, like, profitability, profitability, I'm like, spell it. You know, and I'm like, I bet you don't know it, right? And so the key thing is not just profitability, you know, it's more like classic, you know, sort of go-to phrases or quotes, you know, profitability is an opinion, but free cash flow is a fact. So you have to now decide as an investor, how am I going to get my money out, right? I'm, you know, statistically speaking, it will not be through M&A. Statistically speaking, it will not be IPO. So the only way it has to work, at least to get your returns back on some sort of basic timeline, is to figure out how to get a piece of free cash flow. So your first sort of private responsibility, and yes, it's a very private equity driven model, but here's the thing, until you get either more people investing and buying you out, which is also a viable strategy, right? Because you're an early investor and they want to take up, or you're able to sort of participate in the free cash flow dividends distribution, there's really only two, what I'll call, statistically defensible, viable ways of getting your returns. And you've got to make sure that in your deal structures, you figure it out. I mean, we've had, you know, we've had this thing where, you know, American investors will come, one of them was like, oh, you know, why would we have dividends? We don't do that. And I'm looking at this guy, I'm like, you know, when I was chasing Facebook, you were in high school, what are you talking about? You're going to come and teach me how to do deals? The real problem is that, you know, I don't have, I don't have a, a menu of potential events that I can point to to say, here's what's going to happen. And we've, you know, we have a corporate development um, 
sort of capability within our firm because we realized that to help companies sort of do M&A and the like was an important part of our responsibility. But if I told you how many times we've tried to do M&A in Africa and how hard it is, right, to convince entrepreneurs, listen, you're better off coming together and attacking this market than doing it separately. It's still really hard, right? So, you know, and giving everybody a choice, at a shot at some exit in the future, it's still really hard. But, you know, as, as, when it comes to viability, the two things we can see right now, certainly selling it, you know, to later investors, which of course means that your company has to be tracking nicely for you to attract them. Yeah. And then the second thing is, is also figuring out how to participate in sort of a dividend distribution. And that, of course, means that the company is generating enough free cash flow for that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for the audience, if you're tweeting about this, uh, please use the hashtag about live if you only caught part of it we will make the video and uh, transcript available um, or recap rather than transcript available for you and we will send it to everybody who registered for this session if you have want to continue the conversation it will continue on techcabal.com um, you can also continue it in our comments on twitter um, and we will look forward to seeing you from any more of these sessions Again, thank you for joining us, Agosa. And uh, we look forward to seeing everything Echo VC does in this market. Awesome. Thanks a lot for the support. No problem. Thank you. Thank you.